this intro is gonna is gonna be a little different from the intro I, I gave at the very at the very at the very start of this. This intro is just to explain that this is gonna this is for you binge watchers out there. This is gonna be one continuous video from start to finish, no cuts in between, no nothing. So that way, if you if you if you want to, you can watch all of it at once, or you can watch the parts indiv individually individually as well. So sit back and enjoy. Star Trek Generations. Hello everyone there in the YouTube world. My name is John Kenobi. Like always, I got a good one for you today. Back when I was in high school, whenever I had time after I finished my schoolwork, I would do my own write down my own versions of the Star Trek movies. I had my own char character, I kind of did my own version of it. I never really published them. I didn't do anything with them. It was just something I did in my spare time. Well, I decided to change that and I'm going to be uploading my own fanfics of the Star Trek movies and eventually the Star Wars movies. So, let's start with Star Trek Generations and I'm actually going to be starting just before the events of Encounter at Farpoint. It's going to be starting just before that. So sit back and enjoy Star Trek Generations. I had done it. I had finished the academy and was heading for my first assignment. I was to be the helmsman of a starship. And not just any starship. I was to be the helmsman of the newly commissioned USS Enterprise NCC-1701D. After I got my orders, I head for the closest turbo lift that would take me to a shuttle bay. As I was waiting for the lift, I noticed that someone else had come to the lift and was waiting. I turned to greet them when I noticed that it was none other than my commanding officer, Captain Jean-Luc Picard. As soon as I saw him, I snapped to attention and said, Captain Picard. He looked at me and said, At ease, Ensign. Where are you off to? I relaxed and said, The Enterprise, sir. I'm the helmsman. Ensign Jonathan Dibble. Ah, uh, yes. I thought it was you. Congratulations on the assignment, Ensign. Thank you, sir. And may I say that it is an honor to serve on this ship. He simply nodded his head. By this time, the lift had arrived, and we headed for the shuttle bay. When we got there, I went over all the pre-flight checks, and we were off. On the way to the Enterprise, Captain McCart noticed the weapon I had on my belt. What kind of weapon is that, Ensign? Oh, it's my lightsaber, sir. It has an energy type blade and can deflect weapons fire. Deflect it where? I looked at him and said, allegedly, back at the person who fired it. However, I'm not very good at that yet. Then he asked me about my gloved hand. It was an accident, sir. I was training on the holodeck when my lightsaber, with my lightsaber, spar sparring with another, another hologram that had a lightsaber. I always used a holodeck lightsaber for safety reasons. However, no one noticed that the safety protocols were malfunctioning. I went to block, and the hollow character took my hand clean off. Ensign, your record showed that you're not completely human. No, sir. I have all the abilities of a human spider. I can stick to walls, shoot weapon from my hands, and have superhuman strength and reflexes. And that's why I don't just have a flesh and blood hand instead of a robotic hand. The captain looked at me a little funny. It's a constant reminder that even though I have all these powers and abilities, in the end, I'm still human. He nodded his head like he understood. I looked at the console and noticed a shadow coming over us. Captain McCart said, there she is, Ensign, the Enterprise. I looked up and my jaw hit the floor. She was huge, a brand new gla class ship called Galaxy Class. With a total of 42 decks, she could easily hold over 1,000 people including families. We landed in the main shuttle bay and headed for the bridge. When we got there, I was amazed at how big the bridge was. Captain McCart said, let me introduce you to some of the other senior officers. A woman with dark curly hair came up. This is Counselor Deanna Troy. She is half human, half betazoid. I looked at her and said, so you can read my mind, ma'am? She smiled. No, Ensign. I can only feel your emotions. I said, I said, okay. Then a person came up who could not have been any paler if he tried. 
I realized that this was Lieutenant Commander Data, the science officer, and the second officer of Android. I went up and shook his hand. It's a pleasure, sir. I've heard a lot about you. I've heard a lot about you as well, Ensign. Then a blonde-haired girl came up to us. Ensign, this is Lieutenant, the, Lieutenant Tashiar, our Chief of Security. I said, ma'am, and she said, Ensign. Then she turned to Captain Picard. Captain, sorry to bring this up, but one of my officers was unable to report to duty because of a pretty bad illness. It's not life-threatening or anything. He is just not well enough to report to duty. Now, it's a very minor problem, but I'm now short-staffed. I stepped forward and said, I can help, ma'am. Then a Klingon came up and said, With all due respect, sir, I do not see how this ensign, who has had no experience being in security and does not look that strong, can be a security officer. Captain Picard turned to me and said, Ensign, this is Lieutenant Junior Grade Worf. I just smiled. Apparently, Mr. Worf was not aware of what I could do. I turned to Captain Picard. Captain, request permission to give a little demonstration. He smiled because he knew that I had superhuman strength and said, permission granted. I turned to Mr. Worf and said, I challenge you to the Bahaku challenge. Now, this is pretty much the Klingon version of arm wrestling. He looked at me and said, said that no human has won that challenge. I said, I know. He did, however, accept my challenge. After we deactivated the security console, we got into position. I asked Mr. Data to tell us when to start, and he gave the countdown. Wa, Cho, Wei. We started, and at first we were evenly matched, and that threw Worf off guard, but he recovered. Then I upped my strength, and he slowly started to lose. Then with one final push, he lost, and he was very surprised. I returned to the Lieutenant Yard. Ma'am, it may not look like it, but I do have superhuman strength, and I can be a valuable asset to your team. She said she agreed. I turned to Mr. Worf. I hope I did not dishonor you, sir. He said, not at all. I'm actually honored. With that, Captain McCart told me to take my position so we can get the rest of the senior officers. I went to the helm, and we got clearance from dock control. I cleared all moorings and put the thrusters on standby. I told Captain McCart that we were ready for departure. He gave the order. Take us out, Ensign. One quarter impulse. Also by this, I turned around and said, Sir, regulations state that ships are only used maneuvering thrusters when leaving space dock. He smiled and said, I'm glad you were, pay you were paying attention. Take us out. Full thrusters. I turned back to my console and said, Full thrusters. Aye, sir. And I took us out manually. Now, why manually? Auto would be easier. Yes, auto would be easier. However, some of my best evasive maneuvers were done manually and I wanted to get a feel for how the Enterprise handed manually. As soon as we were clear of space dock, I turned to Captain Picard. We are free and clear to navigate, sir. Take us to Farpoint, Ensign. Warp 4. Aye, sir. Warp 4. Engage. Then with a the push of a button, I started an adventure that would end a disaster to save billions of lives. Over the next several years, I slowly climbed the ranks. The biggest changes came during our second year. Lieutenant Yard died in the line of duty, and Mr. Worf and myself were made Chief of Security. I told Captain Picard that I had no problem being Chief of Security, however, I wanted to remain on the career path, and he said that was fine. We also got a new Chief Engineer, Jordy, Lieutenant, Jordy Lefor Lieutenant Commander Jordy LaForge, who manned the helm when I was not on the bridge. He was made Chief Engineer because he was a really good engineer. Everything was going well. Until one day, seven years later, I was in my quarters meditating, when all of a sudden I was knocked out with a Vulcan nerve pinch. When I came to, I was moving. I tried to stand up, but I felt I fell back down because the deck was the deck was moving. I went to tap my comm badge, but I realized that I did not have I did not have it. I did not have to wait long to find out what was going on. I heard the voice of the first officer, Commander William T. Riker. Bring up the prisoner! I really had no idea what was going on, or what I did. I heard drum rolls, then a door opened, and I stepped out into a very bright light. When I got my eyesight back, I saw a lot of blue. I realized I was on a ship on the water. I found out later that the ship I was on was the HMS Enterprise. When I was on the main deck, the drums stopped. 
Captain Carr looked at me and said, Commander Dibble, I always knew this day would come. Are you prepared to face the charges? I had no idea what he was talking about. I was about to say something, and Counsel Troy nudged me and told me to answer him. I looked Captain Carr right in the eye and said, I am prepared. Captain Carr turned to Commander Riker and said, Number one. Commander Riker stepped forward, pulled out an old style scroll and said, and read from it. We are the officers and crew of the USS Enterprise, being of sound mind and judgment, hereby make the following charges against Commander Jonathan Dibble. One, that he did it knowingly and willfully go above and beyond the call of duty on countless occasions. After that, it took all my self-control not to roll my eyes. Two, most seriously, that he has earned the admiration and respect of the entire crew. With that, Captain Carr made his announcement. Commander Dibble, with the power invested in me by Starfleet Command, I hereby promote you to the rank of Captain, with all the rights and privileges thereto. And may God have mercy on your soul. With that, everyone on the deck started cheering, and I was all smiles. Captain Picard, Captain Picard and Commander Riker came over to me and shook my hand. Congratulations, Mr. Zill. Thank you, sir. Jonathan, you're a captain now. You can call me Jean-Luc. I said, let's give that a little time. Now, for my first order, get these binders off me. Commander Riker said, oh, sorry, and I removed them. Then he said, bring out the other prisoner. I quickly moved out, out of the way, and Mr. Worf came out of another hatch. They did the same thing with him, and he was promoted to lieutenant commander. I thought that was that, and Commander Riker said, Extend the plank! I was a little confused, until he said, Lower the badge of office. I looked up, and two hats came down. I decided to amuse everyone. I went for first, and Mr. Worf was behind me. Commander Riker said that we won't make it. No one ever has. I was about to prove him wrong. We inched our way out on the plank until we were right under our hats. I said, on the count of jump. Jump. We jumped, got the hats, and landed. Everybody was cheering. I heard Captain Picard say, if it's one thing I've, I've learned over the years, it's to never underestimate Klingon and never underestimate Mr. Dibble. We put our hats on, the commander Riker said, Computer, remove the plank! And that's when my spider-sense kicked in. As the plank started to disappear, I backflipped over Mr. Warp, and he went into the drink. Everyone on the deck started laughing and pointing. I went over to Commander Riker and said, Commander, that's retract plank, not remove plank. He just said, of course, sir. He looked down at Commander Worf and said, Sorry! I looked down to see Worf shake his fist at Will. Data came over to me and said, Sir, I must confess, I do not understand how someone falling into freezing water is amusing. I have to give Data a lot of credit. When I met him seven years, seven years ago, he had almost no understanding of humans. Now there are still things that puzzled him, but nowhere near as much as back then. So I answer this question. It's all in good fun data. Fun, sir. Fun! I did not understand. I tried a different approach. You need to learn to be in the spirit of things. Live in the moment. Do something unexpected. Get it? And he said he got it. He turned to Dr. Crusher, our chief medical officer, and I'm not kidding, he pushed her overboard and she went down. Worf, who was climbing back up, tried to catch her, but ended up back in the water instead. Now everyone on the deck was silent. I was actually trying not to laugh as I said, that's not quite what I had in mind, Mr. Data. Data looked around and realized that no one was laughing. Jordy went over to him and said, Data. Data tried to defend himself and said, that was, before he could finish, Jordy said, not funny. Worf was the first to get back on, on the deck. And he shot a mean glare at Commander Riker. Then Dr. Crusher followed. Data reached his hand out to help her, but she reached her hand to me, and I helped her out, and she gave a pretty mean look at Data before she left the holodeck along with Mr. Worf. Once everyone was on board, I gave out orders. All hands make sail! To Gansels and Courses, stand by the braces! 
I walked over to Captain Picard and Commander Riker. As they talked about what this would would have really been like. Just imagine what it was like. No engines, no computers. Just the wind and the sea, and the stars to guide you. I had to agree. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that I would have been an explorer no matter what time period I was in. But of course, Commander Riker had his own opinion. Bad food, brutal discipline, no women. I said, oh, we can't have that, can we? Then the ship's intercon came on. Bridge to Captain Picard. Picard here. There's a personal message for you from Earth. Captain Picard sighed. Put it through down here. He looked at Will and said, the best thing about life at sea was that no one could reach you. This was freedom. But that Captain Picard said, arch, and an arch appeared, which was used for making changes to the current program, or in this case, so Captain Picard could read his message. As he read it, I can see his face go from a smile to a frown to sad. I was not the only one who noticed. Count Troy also noticed and went to talk to him. Before she got to him, Captain Picard took his hat off and put it over his heart like he was honoring someone. Counselor Troy asked if he was okay. Captain Card said he was, and then he left the holiday. I decided to stay for a little while. I turned to Commander LaForge and told him to set royals and stuntsels. He asked what a stuntsel was. I pointed out. He said the last yard arm. Just above that, then there was an urgent call from the bridge. Bridge, the holodeck three. I responded, Dibble here. We're receiving this stress call from the ambulance observatory, sir. They say they're under attack. I was already moving toward the exit as I gave my first order as captain. Roller! All hands to battle stations, Captain Picard to the bridge! I ran for the bridge, not even taking time to put on my uniform. I was not the only one, though, as Data, Riker, and even Worf were on the bridge, wearing what they had on the holodeck. I saw the damage on the station and said that we were too late. Mr. Worf, anticipating what I was going to ask, said that there were no other ships in the system. Captain McCart entered the bridge from the observation lounge. I turned to face him. Captain, we're approaching Amagosa. It appears that the station took quite a beating. Yes, sir, were there any survivors? Data looked at his console and said that the sensors were picking up five life signs on the station. Commander Riker said the station complement was 19. Captain McCart said to stand down from red alert. He sighed and told me to begin an investigation. I was about to say something when he yelled, Just do it! I was a little startled by this, but I quickly recovered. I told Mr. Worf to follow me, and that Commander Riker had the bridge. Then I had a security team and Dr. Crusher report to Transporter Room 3. Before I headed to the Transporter Room, I headed for my quarters to put my uniform on and get my phaser and lightsaber. When I went to put my uniform on, I noticed the box on my desk. I opened it and found my fourth gold rank pip. I put it on my collar, and I could not help but smile. I grabbed the rest of my gear, then headed for the transporter room. When I got there, Mr. Worf and Dr. Crusher had just arrived. When everyone was ready, we got on the transporter pad, and I ordered phases on stun. Then I, I turned toward the transporter chief and said, Energize. When I rematerialized, it was pretty dark. However, even before I turned on my palm light, my spider sense, which warns me of any unseen dangers, was saying there was nothing. I sweeped my light around to get my bearings. This dwarf started to go in one direction, and I told him to stick with me. I noticed some scorch marks on the bulkhead that looked like blast points. I asked Mr. Dwarf what we made of them. He looked at them and said they were consistent of a Type 3 disruptor. I said, great. That narrows it down to Romulan Breen Klingons. One of the security officers, who was still fresh out of the academy, asked how it could be the Klingons. Wouldn't we allies? I looked at him and said, Ensign, there are still Klingons who do not like the Federation. I told everyone to spread out. We walked around, walked around the station, which was a complete mess. I started to think that the five life signs picked up were now, were now gone. Mr. Worf hollowed out, over here! I ran over to him as he said, it's all right, do not struggle. I called Dr. Crusher over to our location, and I helped Worf get a pretty big piece of bulkhead off the person that was under it. Even with its weight and bulk, between Mr. Worf's strength and mine, we got it. Once that piece was gone, a 
arm reached up, and I said, it's okay, we're right here. Then after moving one more piece, I was able to grab, grab hold of the arm and say, got him. I pulled up a humoric male. I showed my light at him and said, I'm Captain Jonathan Dibble of the USS Enterprise. He blinked a little and said he was Soren, Dr. Tolian Soren. I asked who attacked him. Still trying to collect himself, he said that he did not know. It all happened so fast. I was about to question him further when one of the security officers on the upper deck called me and said that I needed to look at something. I told Dr. Crusher to stay with Dr. Storm and for Worf to follow me. We went up to where the security officer was and he was standing over a dead body. I bent down and turned the body over to see that it was a dead Romulan. I turned around to Worf and said, well, now we know who attacked the station. Now the question is, why would the Romulans attack a Federation outpost? We finished looking around the station and found another dead Romulan, and the other four life snacks. Once we found everyone, I gave out orders. Dr. Crusher, take us the fire survivors to sick bay, get them cleaned up, and then get their quarters. Also put the Romulans in the morgue, but do not, under any circumstances, perform an autopsy. She said, aye, sir. Then I turned to Mr. Worf. Worf, take anything Romulan to main engineering. I want to know what the Romans were doing and what they were looking for. I said, aye, sir. Then I said, I needed to report to Captain McCarr. With that, I tapped my combat and said, deal with Enterprise. Want to beam up. When I rematerialized in the transporter room, I headed for the main bridge. When I got there, I stood in front of the ready room and hit the chime button, and Captain McCarr said, come. I entered the ready room, and Captain McCarr was looking out the window. He turned around and looked at me and, and did a half smile and told me that now that I was captain, I did not have to knock, so to speak. I said, sir, this is still your office. For me to enter without knocking would not be appropriate. He said that I had a point, then asked for my report. I found two dead Romulans. I had Mr. Wolf analyze their equipment to find out which ship they came from and what they were doing on the station. Captain McCarr asked me if there was any indication as to why they attacked the station. I said, no, sir. They practically tore the place apart, accessed the central computer, turned the cargo bay inside out. They were obviously looking for something. Captain McCarr said this could signify a new Romulan threat in this sector. I shook my head. I don't think so, sir. I was about to explain why when the ship's intercom went off. Pressure to McCarr. Captain McCarr said, go ahead, doctor. Jean-Luc. One of the sci scientists said Dr. Swarm wants to speak to you and Jonathan right away. We looked at each other and I said, We're a little busy right now, Doc. She said she, said she knew that and, she, and said it to him. However, he said it was absolutely imperative that he speaks with us right away. We looked at each other again. I nodded and said, Understood. Is he still in sick bay? No, sir. He left and headed for 10 forward. I said, Thank you. The captain card myself headed for deck 10. When I got in the turbo lift, I ordered it to take us to Deck 10. On the way there, Captain Picard asked me what my plans were after this little assignment. I thought for a moment and said, I was thinking about taking a little shore leave, seeing my family on Earth, then thinking about going to DS9. I'm sure they would not mind another pair of hands in case of the Dominion, Dominion attack. He said that sounded like a good idea. Then he said that for my final assignment on the Enterprise, and for my first assignment as Captain, he wanted me to take over the investigation. I said, thank you, sir. I won't let you down. The lift let, let us off at deck 10, and we headed for 10 forward. 10 forward was the ship's local bar and gathering place for ship personnel and guests. It did, did have one of the best views on the ship. When we arrived, we went in, and I saw Jordy and Data at the bar talking to Guyna. And I was not sure but I swear I saw a huge smile on Data's face. I quickly dismissed that in spite of one of the waiters. He came over to us and, and I said that we were looking for Dr. Storm from the observatory. He pointed over to one of the, one of the windows and I spotted him. I said, thank you. The Captain Carter and myself walked over to him. When I got close enough, I called his name. Dr. Storm. He turned around. Yes. Then when he saw so I said, ah, he said, oh yes, Captain McCarr and Captain Dibble, thank you for seeing me. 
said, it's awesome, Charge. I said, I understand there's some urge you want to speak to us about. He said, yes, I must return to the observ observatory immediately. I have been running a critical experiment on the Amagosa star. Unfortunately, I had to turn down his request. We are still run running our investigation into the attack. As soon as he tried to interrupt me, but I did not let him. As soon as that is complete, I will allow you and your colleagues to return. Until then, there is nothing I can do. He tried more, one more time. Timing is very important in my experiment. If it is not completed within the next 12 hours, years of research will be lost. I stood my ground on my decision. We're doing the best we can. Now, if you will excuse me. Captain Carter and myself turned to leave. However, Soren was not, was not, was not done with us. He grabbed Captain Card's arm, and I turned around and said, Hey! Then Soren leaned into whisper into Captain Card's ear and said, They say time is the fire in which we burn. That caused Captain Card to go into shock and just stare at Soren. Right now, right now, Captain, my time is running short. Before anything else could be said, this dwarf came on over the intercom and asked me to come to main engineering. I said I was on my way. Then I turned back to Dr. Storm and told him to release Captain Picard now. He did. Captain Picard left 10 forward. I told the doctor that I would do what I could. Then I left 10 forward and hit it for main engineering. Now, there have been times I would take the turbo lift, and there were times I would take the Jeffrey's tubes to get a little exercise. This time, I took the Jeffrey's tubes. When I got to engineering, I asked Mr. Worf for a report. We have finished analyzing the Rhineland tricorder. It seems they were looking for a compound called trilithium. This, uh, this puzzle, trilithium? Yes, an experimental compound that the Rhinelands have been working on. In theory, it can neutralize all fusion within a star. However, they have never found a way to stabilize it. It seems like every time we answer a question, we get two more. Now, the Federation uses trilithium also. It's a highly toxic waste product produced by our ship en ship's engines. It's usually dumped at star bases, not observatories. I asked out loud why would the Romans look for it on a Federation observatory? It does not make any sense. Worf shook his head and said he did not know. I told him to have Data and Geordi beam over with the next UA team. Have them scan for any trilithium, trilithium traces. He said, I sir. And then, then I headed for, for a turbo lift. When I got to the turbo lift, I had it take me to the main bridge. On the way, I started thinking. I said, halt turbo lift. The lift came to a stop. I asked the computer where Captain Picard was. The computer said that he was, he was in his quarters. I thought for a moment, and I made my choice. I told the computer to reroute the lift to deck five, officer's quarters. When the lift arrived, I headed to the captain's quarters. On the way, I ran into Counselor Troy, who was also on her way to see the captain and I'm pretty sure she was going to see him for the same reason I was. We got to his quarters, and she pushed the chime button, and there was no response. I pushed the button, and this time he said, Yes, come. The door opened, and we entered. Captain Carr turned to greet us and asked if there was anything we could do, he could do for us. The following conversation happened between Captain Troy and Captain McCarr. Actually, I was wondering if there was anything we could do for you. Oh. It's just family matters. You never met my brother and his wife, did you? He walked over to his desk and I said, No, I, no, can't say that I have, sir. We sat down and he pointed to a picture. Robert, so opinionated, so pompous and arrogant. He always had to have the last word. I was going to get together with them all next month. On Earth. Renee has always wanted to see Starfleet Academy. Renee? Oh, your nephew. Yes. He's so unlike his father. And with his next statement, he just broke down crying. So very gentle. I asked what happened. Robert and Renee, they burned to death in a fire. I did not even know these people. However, this really upset me. I said that I was sorry. Then he put his hand on Counselor Troy's on Counselor Troy's hand, hand because she put her hand on his shoulder. And he said that it was alright. These things happened. The end was flabbergasted. Flabbergasted. Captain, it's not all right. Then through tears he said that he could not stop thinking about the things Renee would not be able to experience, like reading books, 
going to school, falling in love. But that he closed his photo album and said that it was not going to happen now. He stood up, wiped his nose, and Contra Troy said that his family history was very important to him. He said yes. All his life he had heard about the Greek cards and all of their accomplishments. And then, I said when your brother married and had a family, you did not think it was your responsibility to carry on the family line. He said, yes, that was correct, exactly. I'd always thought that that with Rivera, the family would have gone. But after me, there'd be no more Picards. Before anything else could be said, the sun outside got really bright and then dark. I saw this happen, and I was like, what in the world? And I ran to the bridge, along with Captain Picard and Counselor Troy. As soon as I was on the bridge, I asked for a report. Van Riker said that all nuclear fusion was breaking down. Captain Carp asked how that was possible. Ms. Orr said that the sensor readings show a solar probe launched toward the star a moment ago. I turned to Ms. Orr. Orr, is it possible that the probe had trilithium in it? Ms. Orr said it was possible. Captain Picard wanted to know what we were talking about. I told him I would tell him later. Then Orr said that the star has produced a low 12 shockwave. Dr. Troy said that would destroy everything in this system. I was about to tell the helmsman to get us out of here when we got an urgent call from the transporter room. Transporter room 3 to bridge. I can't locate Commander LaForge or Mr. Data, sir. Commander Riker asked if they, were, if they returned to the ship. Worf quickly looked at his console and said they were not on board. I asked how long until the shockwave hits the observatory. Worf said 4 minutes, 40 seconds. I told Worf that he was with me, and we ran for the, for the transporter room. When we got to the observatory, we booked it for the control room. When we got closer, my spider sense kicked in, and I told Mr. Worf to get down. A second later, the disruptor blast whizzed past my head. I looked up to see that it was Dr. Soren who had fired the shot. I wanted to know what he was doing. I put my phaser out and fired a couple shots at him. Captain Picard came on over my comm badge. And Bryce to Captain Dibble. You got two minutes left. I hollered out, you hear that, Soren? We got a low 12 shockwave coming in. We gotta get out of here! His answer was to fire more shots. Now, at this point, I could have pulled my lightsaber out and blocked the shots he was firing. However, I was still not very good at this, and I did not want to risk hitting Worf, Jordy, or Data. So I told Worf to hold Soren off while I tried to get to Data. I could have gotten to the forge, however, he was too close to Soren. As soon as Worf got Soren's attention, I got on the ground and crawled over to Data as quietly and quickly as I could. I managed to get to him and told him to see if he can get to Jordy. And I'm not kidding, in a scared voice, Data said, I... I cannot, sir. I was utterly perplexed. Then I heard a voice say, prepare for transport. Then I saw a red transporter take Dr. Soren and Jordy away. I grabbed Data and slapped my comm badge into the transporter room to beam three people directly to the bridge. As soon as we were materialized, I ran to the helm, turned it around, and set a random course, and engaged at warp one. Now I could have done a higher warp speed, however, warp one was good enough since most shockwaves cannot travel faster than the speed of light. After we were away, I asked Captain Picard what happened. He said that a Klingon bird of prey teak cloaked and then recloaked. I said, well, yet again we have we answered one question and have another. What are the Klingons up to? I turned to Data, who was still freaking out a little, and causing a little scene. So I went over to him and said that everything was going to be fine, and I reached around his back and turned him off. I did manage to catch him before he hit the floor. I gave him his dwarf and told him to take him to sick bay. I want to know what is wrong with him. He said, aye, sir. Then I turned to Commander Riker and told him to find out everything he could about Dr. Soren. I turned to Captain Picard and I asked if I could talk to him in the Red Room. He said, of course. As we head for the Red Room, I told Counselor Troy that she had the bridge. When we got to the Red Room, I turned to Captain Picard and said, I'm pretty sure that the Bromlings are innocent over what happened. He wanted to know what I meant. My guess is that the Klingons stole trilithium, brought it to Dr. Soren on the observatory, and the Bromlings came looking for it. Captain Picard said that he agreed. I thought for a moment and said, I want to try and return the dead Romulans that we found. How do you plan on doing that? I tap my combat. Deal with a bridge. Open a subspace channel to, Ron to Romulus, please. 
There was a slight pause before the officer said, Aye, sir. I sat down in the chair and looked at the little view screen on the desk. A few moments later, a Ronlin came on the screen and wanted to know what I wanted. I said that my name was Captain Jonathan Dibble of the Enterprise. I told him about the attack on the observatory and the two dead Ronlins we found, we found and the trilithium. He got a little angry with me and started accusing me of accusing the Ronlins. I stopped him and, I, and said I was not doing anything like that. I realized that the Romans were just as much victims as we were. He did calm down after that and asked me what I wanted. I said that I wanted to return the dead Romans to their families, so I'm requesting permission for the Enterprise to come to Romulus. He thought for a moment and said, Very well, permission granted. If you do anything other than go to Romulus, I stopped him and said, There is no need to threaten. I know what will happen. He signed off and, looked, and I looked over Captain Carr and he said he was pleased. I went up to the bridge, went to the helmsman and said, Ensign, I know this may sound a little weird, but I need you to lay a course to Romulus, warp 9. He said, aye, sir. I stayed on the bridge during the entire trip working on the report and what happened on station. When we got to Romulus, we, get, we gave the, them the coordinates of the moor where their comrades were. Once they were off ship, I told the helmsman to get us out of here, maximum warp. Once we were underway, I got a call from sickbay. It was Dr. Crusher and Commander Riker letting me know they had, they had the information on Dr. Storm. As soon as he said that, Captain Picard came onto the bridge and I said I was on my way. Then Captain Picard took command and I headed for, I headed for sickbay. When I got to sickbay, Dr. Crusher came over to me and said that she had the information that I asked for. I asked where Commander Riker was. She said that he was needed in engineering. I said, okay, what do you have? She put the information on the screen. He's an Elorian, over 300 years old. He lost his family when the Borg destroyed his home planet. However, Sorn and a handful of other refugees escaped on, on board a ship called the Lakul. That ship was later destroyed by some kind of energy ribbon. But Sorn and 46 others were rescued by the Enterprise B. I said, that was the mission. I said, that was the mission where James Kirk was killed. That was probably one of the more famous missions. Three Starfleet legends, Captain Scott, Commander Chekhov, and Captain James T. Kirk were on the new Enterprise B for her shakedown cruise. During the shakedown, they answered a distress call, even though they had no medical staff, a tractor beam, or torpedoes. In the end, Captain Kirk was killed, saving the Enterprise, and it was now regulations that no ship could leave space dock without a full crew and all ship systems operational. I asked Dr. Crusher if she found anything else out. Well, I did check the crew manifest of the cool. Guess who else was on board? She hit a key and a picture of Guinan came up. I smiled a little and asked the computer to locate Guinan. Guinan is in her quarters. As I headed for, for quarters, I realized that in the seven years that she has been on the Enterprise, I have never seen her, I've never been to her quarters. I just wish it was for better circumstances. When I got to her quarters, I rang the chime and she said, come in. I entered and she smiled and asked if this was a social call. I said, unfortunately, no. Does the name Soren ring a bell? She looked down and said that Soren was a name she had not heard in a long time. Do you know him? Yes. Guinan? It's very important that you tell me everything you know. We believe that he is building a weapon. A terrible weapon. One that might might even give him enough power to... And she stopped me. Soren does not care about weapons or power. He just cares about the Nexus. When she said that, she was a little hesitant. I asked her what the Nexus was. The energy weapon, energy ribbon that destroyed that ship it was not just some random phenomenon. It's a doorway to a place that we call the Nexus, and it's a place I've tried very, very hard to forget. I sat down next to her. Guinan, I understand how difficult this must be for you, but I must, must know what happened. She, she sighed and smiled a little. It was like being inside joy. Like joy was something tangible that you could wrap yourself in like a blanket. And you were being from that? She corrected me. Pulled, ripped away. None of us wanted to go, and I would give anything, anything, to go back. And once I realized that was not possible, I decided, I decided to move on. I asked about 
sword. If he was still obsessed, he could be a very dangerous man. I asked out loud, why would he destroy a star? I said, thank you for your time, Guy. I got up to leave. I was almost at the door when Guinan said one last thing. If you go, you're not going to care about anything. Not the ship, not Soren, not me, no one. All you'll want is to stay in the Nexus. I thought for a moment, looked at her and said, I give you my word, that will never happen. Then I left her quarters. Captain's Log, sorry, 4863.4. Dr. Crusher has informed me that Data's emotion chip, which is the cause for his strange behavior of late, has been fused into his neural net and cannot be removed. However, she believes that he is fit for duty, so I asked him to join me in stellar photography. I was still amazed at the stellar photography room, even after all these years. This room had information on every planet that had been discovered by the Federation. Data said that the energy ribbon appears on our section of the galaxy every 39.1 years. It will pass this system for approximately 24 hours. Yes, Guinan was right. He said that someone was trying to get back to the ribbon. Now, if that's true, there must be a connection between it and the Amagosa star. Data, pull up any of the effects that the star's destruction had, no matter how ins insignificant. I looked at Data, and he was staring off into space. I called out to him. Data? He stepped out of it and said, Sorry, sir. He hit a few keys on the console, said that it would take the computer a few moments to compile the information. Then he started staring to space again. I got a, little, got a little worried, and I asked if he was okay. He sighed. No, sir. I am having difficulty concentrating, and I am feeling guilty concerning my actions on the observatory. I wanted to save Jordy, but I felt something I did not expect. Fear. I was afraid. I wanted to say something, but the computer beeped, indicating that it was done, and Data shifted his focus on the screen. According to our information, the following effects have occurred. Gravity fields have raised by 0.05%. The Starship Bozeman had to make a minor course correction. Ambient magnetic fields, I stopped. Wait. The Bozeman. Why did she change course? Because of the gravity increase, throws off the starship's warp field. Because of it, the starships passing in the sector need to make a minor course correction. Pieces of the puzzle were starting to come together. I asked him where the ribbon was now. He made a small dot appear where the ribbon was. I asked if he could project the ribbon's course. There was a pause, then he said, no, and stood up. I looked at him a little funny. I can no longer continue with this investigation. I wish to be deactivated until Dr. Crusher can remove the emotion chip. I asked if he was experiencing some kind of malfunction. No, sir. I simply do not have the ability to control these emotions. Data, I have nothing but sympathy for what you are feeling. Which I did. But right now, I need... And then it lashed out at me. Sir, I no longer want these emotions. Deactivating me is the only viable solution. I was starting to lose a little patience. Data, part of having feelings is learning to integrate them into your life. No matter the circumstance. As I was saying this, he kept say, saying that he could not. I finally lost it. This Starfleet officer is acting like a child. You will not be deactivated. You're an officer on board this ship, and I require you to perform your duty. That is an order, Commander. That got his attention. And he said, yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Then he, sa then he sat back down. As he did, I said it that it takes courage to admit our feelings. And sometimes courage can be in motion, too. I repeated my last request. Now, can you project the course of the ribbon? Yes, I believe so, sir. A line appeared on the screen, and I noticed that data was a lot more focused. I asked where the Amagosa star was. A really small dot appeared on the screen, so I had data enhanced grid 9A. The image got bigger, as did the dot. Something did not seem right. Now, you said that, that gravity had shifted in the sector. Did the computer take that into account when it projected the course of the ribbon? Data said no. He would make the appropriate adjustments. He hit a couple keys, and the ribbon moved. I gasped a little as the next piece of the puzzle fell in. So that's what he's doing. He's changing the course of the ribbon. But why would he destroy a star? 
why not just fly into it with a ship? Data said that any ship that has approached the ribbon has either been destroyed or severely damaged. So we can't get to the ribbon. So he's making the ribbon come to him. Data. Does the ribbon come near any M class planets? Data scanned the data banks and said, Yes, sir. There are two of them in the Viridian system. He pulled the system up, and I can see the two planets with the ribbon closer to one planet than the other. I said, It gets, it gets close to Viridian 3, but not close enough. Then a thought struck me, and it was not good. Data. What would happen to the ribbon if Storm destroyed the Viridian star itself? Data ran a projection. The star went dark, and the ribbon went right through Viridian 3. And the final piece of the puzzle clicked into place. So that's where he's going. Data said that it should be noted that the destruction of the star would produce a shockwave similar to the one we observed at Amagosa. I said destroying all the planets in the system. Without me asking, Data told me what I needed to know. Viridian 3 is uninhabited. However, Viridian 4 has a pre-warp civilization in the early part of industrial development. I asked what the population was. 230 million, sir. I thought for a moment, and I made my choice. I topped my comm badge. Double the bridge. I caught here. Set a course for Viridian 3, maximum warp. I felt the ship jump to warp, and I thought to myself, I hope we're not too late. It took us about two hours to get to the system. When we got there, I had Mr. Warp scan the system for any Klingon ships. He did a quick scan and said that there were none. I said they're out there. Open the channel. He said that the channels were open. Klingon vessel, we know what you're doing, and we will destroy any probe launched toward the Verdian Star. We demand that you return our chief engineer and leave the system at once. I told, Mr. I told Warp to repeat that message every three minutes. After 30 minutes, there was no response. Commander Riker was wondering if they were even out there. I said they're just wondering if a 50-year-old bird of prey is a match for the Federation flagship. Count your choice said that perhaps they're on the surface. I walked past Mr. Worf and he got my attention. Got them. I've been running some numbers. A probe launch from the surface or from a ship would take exactly 11 seconds to reach the sun. However, since we do not have an exact point of origin, he paused and said it would take between 8 and 15 seconds for our weapons to lock onto it. I said that was a pretty big margin of error. Captain Carr said it was much too big. He said that we needed to get to Storm. Worf's console beat, and he said that a Klingon bird of prey was deep cloaking directly ahead. I looked at the view screen as the vessel appeared. And then Mr. Worf said that we were being healed. I stood up from the command chair and said, On screen. The image changed to show two Klingon females that I knew all too well. I looked at Captain Picard and said, Captain, what an unexpected pleasure. And Commander Dibble, how good to see you again. I said, it's Captain now. This was the Duras sisters, and we have come across them a couple times. I looked at one of them and said, Lursa, it's imperative that I speak with Soren. He said that the doctor is no longer on the ship. Then I will beam to the surface so I can talk to him. Then the other sister, Bator, said that the doctor values his privacy. He would not be happy if an armed away team disrupted him. So I said, then I will beam to your ship and you can beam me to his location. At this point, Commander Riker stepped forward and said, can't trust them. For all we knew, know they killed Jordy, they might kill you too. They seemed to take offense by that statement. We have not harmed your engineer. I happened to look at Data and saw him give a huge sigh of relief. He has been our guest. The Commander Riker ordered them to return him. And Bator scoffed and said, In exchange for what? Data turned around and said, Me, sir. I was about to say me when Captain Picard came forward and said, Me! I will be your prisoner. But first you must transport me to the surface so that I can speak with Sorn. The sisters talked among themselves. They turned back to the view screen and said, we will consider it a prisoner exchange. Captain Picard said agreed. Then the channel was closed. Captain Picard patted Data's arm. He turned to me and said that I have the bridge. As he turned to leave, I said that I was going with him. He said that I needed to be on the bridge. I can't be in two places at once. I said, 
I think it's time for me to reveal a secret that I've, I've kept since I was a boy. I took a stance and said, I'm going ghost! At that, at that, two white circles appeared at my waist and split into two, going up to my head and the other to my feet. Once the circles were gone, my, uni my entire uniform changed. I had, on a, I had on a solid black costume with white gloves and white boots. My hair went from a dark red to snow white. My eyes changed from a blue, blue color to glowing green. Then I split my body into two so that there was two of me. Then I changed back. I said that I've been keeping this part of it secret since I was since I was since I was ten. One of my powers is the ability to split my body into multiple persons, so I can be in two places at once. Captain Carr looked at me and simply nodded his head, and we headed for the circle lift. I've Dr. Crusher meet us in transport room three. We got to the transport room just as the medical team arrived. Captain McCart and myself stepped onto the transporter pad, and the transporter chief said that we had, he had received the coordinates. I said, energize, and the Enterprise's transporter room faded away. So now, I have added a third, another element to this, that being, being the ghost powers, if you're familiar with Danny Phantom. Again, this is just to add meat to the story. And with good reason at this point. Back when I, when, I, when I originally did this, back in high school, I didn't have the ghost powers. I just, ha I just had the spider powers. I figured that was enough. And the lightsaber. So, this, this, this whole, the whole, if you've seen the movie, the whole part where Captain Picard is on the surface, that part wasn't in my original draft. I added the ghost powers so I could add, so I could add that to this and make the story longer. So, for those of you who are familiar with the movie, after the, after the, the Star Drive section explodes and the Sasa section crash, crash lands on Viridian 3, that's when my original draft ended. And I picked it up again after, after, at the very end, when Captain Picard is, it returned, is returned to the Sasa section, and they start doing, doing a little cleanup. That's where, that's where the story would pick up again completely getting rid of everything that happens on the surface of Viridian 3. So I added the ghost powers so I can add that entire that entire part of the story. So, with that being said, let's continue. When we rematerialized in the Klingon transporter room, the Dura sisters were waiting for us. When they saw me, they wanted to know what I was doing here. I looked at them and said, they just got two for the price of one. They just said, okay, the took our comm badges and beamed us to the surface. The first thing I noticed when we, re when we again rematerialized was that it was really bright. I hoped that it would stay that way. I looked around for a moment, then I heard a voice say, welcome, gentlemen. I turned around, and there was Soren looking down at us, smiling. He said that we must think he was quite the madman. I said the thought had crossed my mind. I know why you're here. You're here to stop me from my perfect plan. Well, good luck. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm rather busy. With that, Soren turned to walk away. Captain Carr was not, ha was not happy. He called out to Soren and started towards him. My spider sense went off. I called out to the captain and told him to wait. But it was too late. He, he ran right into a force field. Then he fell backwards. I ran to him and made sure he was all right. Soren looked at us and said, said, do be careful, please. That's a 50 gigawatt force field. I would not want to see you get hurt. Then he walked off again. Then Captain Card looked at me and I said, I know, sir. You're wondering about my other powers. He said he was. I said, well, it was an accident. You see, my parents were a little fascinated with ghosts. The captain was a little confused. Ghosts? Yes, sir. They created a portal that would allegedly take them to a different realm that the ghosts, li that the ghosts lived in. When they plugged it in, it did not work, so they took a break. I decided to look inside. I put the black suit on that you saw in the Enterprise and went inside. My hand raised the button, and the portal activated. And that's how I got my powers. 
I can go, I can fly through walls, disappear, uh, turn invisible, and other things. Captain Carver was still looking at me, and I said, "Sir, this is the first time in 20 years I have used those powers." Captain Card said that he, that it was all right, but he does have a question. I said, "Yes." Do you have the old going ghost for you to change? I laughed at that and said, No, sir. That would be a little weird. I just think it and it happens. He said, Oh, okay. Let's let's go get Sorn. And I said, Yes, sir. Back on the Enterprise, Data wanted to go see Jordy. However, I told him to wait 15 minutes to give Dr. Crusher a chance to look over Mrs. LaForge. On the bridge, I noticed that everyone was looking at me funny. I turned the council to and asked her to join me in the right room. She said, of course, sir. I turned to Commander Riker and said that he had the bridge. He said, aye, sir. When we got to the red room, I turned to Council Troy and asked her if she had noticed the weird looks that I, I had been getting ever since I revealed my other powers. She said, it's kind of hard not to. Some of these people have served with you for the, last, for the past eight years, and now they find out you have been keeping this big secret. I said, I know. That's why I kept it. There are a lot of people that still think that I have used my powers to help further my career in Starfleet. And that's not even close to the point. What you saw me do out there is the first time I have used those powers in almost 20 years. I thought for a moment that I turned to face the end. Counselor, I'd like you to go out there and explain. Then I thought better of it and said, never mind. Then I left the red room. I got to the bridge and stood in the middle and addressed everyone on the bridge. I want all of you to get a really good look at me. I'm the same person who eight years ago sat in this chair. And I pointed to the helm. Then, for almost six years, I stood right where Lieutenant Commander Worf was standing. I am the same man who has served with you for the past eight years. I am no different because I have powers. Now I want the funny looks to stop. Let's get back to work looking for Captain Picard and the other me. But that, everyone got back to work. The council toy looked at me and just smiled, and I smiled back at her. Back on the surface, Captain Carter and myself were making our way around the force field so we can get to where Sworn was. I had have, I have a point. I could not physically see the force field, however, I could sense it with my spider sense. When we got to Sworn, Captain Picard said that Soren did not have to do this. There must be another way to get him into this nexus. Without looking at us, Soren said that he spent 80 years looking for another way. This was the only one. Then he pulled out a remote control and pushed the button, and the probe decloaked. I was actually hoping that now that the probe is visible, the Enterprise could find it. I decided to pull a pretty heavy string. I looked at Soren and said, what you're about to do is no different from when the Borg destroyed your world. They killed millions too, including your wife, children. And for a moment, it worked. He stood, stopped and looked at us with sadness in his eyes and face. Then that sadness turned into a smirk. He pointed his control pad at us and said, Nice try. He clipped the pad to his belt and started to, to a lower platform. You know, there was a time I would not heard a fly. Then the Borg came. It was then, I, it was then I realized they're all going to die sometime. It's all a matter of how and when. It's like a predator. It's stalking you. Or you can try and slow it down with doctors, medicines, new technologies. But eventually, time will hunt you down and make the kill. Captain Carter, who just recently went through on, on a much smaller scale with Soren went through, tried to contradict what Soren said. It's a mortality that defines us, Soren. It's part of the truth of our existence. And I agree with Captain Picard 100%. It's why I never had a new hand regrown. I wanted my robotic hand to serve as a reminder that I am still mortal. Soren stopped what he was working on and looked, and looked at us with a glare. What if I told you I have found a new truth? Captain Gart said, The Nexus? Soren nodded and said that time has no meaning there. 
The predator has no teeth. With that, he went back to work, and we could not talk to him anymore. Captain Card and the other me had been on the surface a little over half an hour now, and we were having no luck finding them. I approached Mr. Worf and asked if we found them yet. He sighed, no sir. I still cannot locate, locate Captain Card, and I have no idea how to locate the other you, sir. I smiled because I did expect that. You scanned for him just like you would you would me. There are no differences between the two of us. He said, aye, sir, and I patted him on the shoulder and told him to keep trying. The turbo lift door was open, and Data walked out. Even though I told Data to wait 15 minutes to go and see Jordy, I had to wait another five, just in case. As he walked to his station, I told him that the sensors can't, can't penetrate the ion strips, too much interference. Can you find a way to scan for life forms? He sat down at his station with a smile on his face and said he would be happy to, sir. He thought for a moment and said that he just loves scanning for life forms. I rolled my eyes. I was very happy for Data that he had emotions and was one step closer to becoming human. He still had to learn to control his emotions and find when it was appropriate to use certain emotions. Once we were done with this assignment, I was going to have him work with Counselor Troy. When I turned to walk away, he started to sing. Life forms? You tiny little life forms? You precious little life forms? Where are you? Do, 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 do. When he finished, I rolled my eyes again and turned to see that the entire bridge crew was looking at him. I put my hands up and said, Stations! And I got a very funny feeling. Something was not right. Deanna noticed this and asked what was wrong. I said, I'm not sure. I spoke, I spoke into the intercom. Devil to engineering. Jordy, is everything all right down there? The response was instant. Yes, sir. We're just about to run a level three diagnostic on the port plasma relays. I said, understood, and to keep me informed. I sat down in the command chair and asked Mr. Worf what the Klingons were up to. He said, nothing, sir. I shook my head, turned to Counselor Troy, and said, something just feels wrong. Then Mr. Worf said, the Klingons were raising shields, blocking weapons. I immediately sprang into action. I told Worf to raise shields and go to red alert. I watched the Klingons fire a torpedo and watched it go right through our shields and slam into the hull of the ship. And another torpedo did the same thing. Worf said over the roar that they had found a way to penetrate our shields. I told him to lock the phases and return fire. The Enterprise's powerful phase was hit the bird of prey directly and did little damage. Their response was to fire another torpedo. This one caused an explosion next to the helm, and the helmsman went down. I turned the counter to yelled, Deanna, take the helm and get us out of orbit! As she took the helm, Data said that we had hull breaches on decks 31 through 35. Mr. Worf said that last shot took out our main phasers, and we can only fire one torpedo. I was not planning on us firing on the Klingons anymore anyway, because they, they, that may cause them to target a very critical area of the ship, like main engineering or even the bridge. So I knew that we only had one torpedo, so we, we needed to make that shot count. I ran to stand next to Mr. Worf. Worf! What do we know about that old Klingon ship? Are there any weaknesses? It's a Class D-12 bird of prey. They are retired from service because of defective plasma coils. Plasma coils. There's no way we can use that to our advantage. We got hit again. I do not see how. The plasma coil is part of their cloaking device. I knew there must be a way we can use that. Then I had an idea. I went to Data. Data. Would an effective plasma coil be susceptible to some sort of ionic pulse? He thought, for a moment. he thought for a second. Perhaps. Yes. Yes! If we send out a low ionic pulse, we might trigger the coils and reset the cloaking device. Excellent idea, sir! As he was saying this, he stood up and smacked my gut a little. I would have said something, except that we got hit with another torpedo, and he was falling back into his chair. Mr. Worf said that as the cloak begins to engage, your shields will drop. And that would be our shot. I said they would have about two seconds of vulnerability. Mr. Data? Lock on the plasma coil. He said it'd be no problem, and he got to work. I said to myself, so if this would work. It had to work. I ran to Mr. Worf. Worf, prepare that one torpedo we need to hit them the instant they begin to cloak. He said, aye, sir. 
We get one shot at this. Target their primary reactor. About a minute later, Data said that he had, he had accessed their core frequency and he was initiating the ionic pulse. I told him to make it quick. The next torpedo hit us and I heard the explosion happen. I jumped over to the tactical console as the entire back bulkhead exploded. One crew member was not lucky as he was thrown over the tactical station. When I landed, Data said he had sent the, he had sent the pulse. Worf said that they were cloaking, their shields were going down. I gave the order. Fire! Then I watched on the view screen as the torpedo went toward the Klingon ship and hit her. The ship disappeared into space dust. I breathed a full sigh of relief. Then Data stepped forward and pumped his fist and, and said, YES! <clears throat> I was like, oh, good grief. All right. Let's get a deck by deck damage report. I'm pretty sure we have, we have damage on all decks. Make it so. Back on the surface, Captain Card and myself had given up on trying to talk talk to Dr. Soren. So we were trying to find a way to get through the force field. I went behind a rock, Dr. Soren was not looking too close, and went ghost. After I changed, I split myself again and turned invisible, then I flew toward the top of the mountain. Then I had the other me go sit beside Captain Picard, so Soren would not get suspicious. When I got to the mountain, when I got to the top of the mountain, thanks to my spider sense, I found out that the force field went all the way around, and I did not want to try going through the force field with my powers, just in case that did not work, and I ended up losing a limb, or worse, ending up dead. So I joined back up with the other me and told the captain that there was no way there is no way through the force field. We need to find another way. With that, the captain grabbed a couple of rocks and threw one at the force field. When it hit the force field, when it hit, the force field buzzed and the rock was, was disintegrated. Dr. Storm, a little annoyed, came over to the force field and said, Haven't you got anything better to do? With that, both Captain McCarr and myself just sat down and Soren got back to work. I looked around and saw a small hole in the rocks. I took one of the rocks from the captain and threw it at the hole and it went through. I smiled. We had found our way through the force field. I only hope that we were not too late. Back in the Enterprise, we were still getting in damage reports when we got an urgent call from engineer. LaForge the bridge. I did not even look up from the pad I had in my hands when I responded. Go ahead, Jordy. I got a problem down here. The magnetic interlocks have been ruptured. I need... Then I heard an explosion. That was when I looked up from the pad. I heard a lot of shouting. I did not hear everything, but I did hear cool link, move it, and evacu evacuate. I was really hoping that what I thought had happened did not happen. The magnetic interlocks were what kept the matter and antimatter separated. We achieve faster than light travel by mixing matter and antimatter in, an, in a controlled explosion. If the mix was too much, then the core would breach and destroy the ship. Then the missile force screamed to be heard over all the chaos. Bridge, we got a new problem. We're five minutes from war core breach. There's nothing I can do. I thought to myself, well, they, they just get getting better and better. Then Commander Riker gave out orders. Deanna, evacuate everyone to the saucer section. Mr. Data, prepare to separate the ship. One of the unique things the Enterprise could do was separate her soft section. Now most starships have this ability. However, it would be for emergencies only. Once they separate, they can't undo it. With the Galaxy class ships, they can separate and put themselves back together. However, this would not be the case. I hope we can evacuate everyone and separate in time. Back on the surface, I was meditating, waiting for the right moment to get under the force field. Finally, the moment came. Soren finished his adjustments to the probe and walked away from it. He started for some stairs, then turned towards us. Now you'll have to excuse me, Captain. I have business with eternity, and I don't want to be late. With that, he headed up, he headed up the stairs, and Captain Picard and myself started to pull bigger so we can get through and get the storm. 
back on the Enterprise, I hop. I got on the comm and told Jory that the core breach was accelerating. We needed to get out of here. He responded by saying that everyone was out. Data said that there was one minute till the warp core breach. I told Data to begin the separation sequence and told Deanna to go to full impulse once we were clear. Warp said the warp core was going critical. Even though I knew that separation sequence was going as quick as it could, it still felt like it was taking forever, which I guess makes sense since we are only moments away from being destroyed. Finally, Data said that the separation sequence was complete. Deanna said that she was engaging impulse engines. Then Data said that the core breach was in progress. I said, on screen. The view screen changed just in time so I could see the star drive section explode. I thought to myself that it was a little ironic that the very first thing that the Enterprise did was a saucer section with me at the helm. And now the last thing the Enterprise would do is an emergency saucer separation. I cannot think about it too long because the shockwave hit us and the ship jolted one way. Everyone on the bridge was thrown from, the, from their station except for Deanna, Data, and myself because the inertial dampeners were pushed beyond their limits. The computer came on and said that the primary stabilizers were offline, engaging secondary systems. Just as everyone righted themselves, another shockwave hit us, and the same thing happened. Over the chaos, I ordered a report. Counter choice said that the helm controls were offline. I looked up at the view screen to see the planet getting closer. Without helm controls, we would not be able to enter orbit. Then I heard Data say, Oh, shit. And I could not help but agree with it. On the surface, we finally got the hole, the hole big enough. I slipped through with ease and went ghost so I could float there. As Captain McCarr was coming through, his shoulder hit one of the rocks, which came loose and hit the force field. I looked up to see that Soren had noticed this. Captain Picard was stuck. When my spider sense went off, I grabbed the captain, turned him and myself invisible, just as the disruptor blast hit the rocks we were at. On the Enterprise, once I realized that we were entering the planet's atmosphere, I took the helm from Deanna and did everything I could to get helm control back online. I pulled every trick I learned over the years. When I looked at the view screen and saw the ground coming up, I knew that we, were, that we were out of time, and I said there was nothing I can do. I said I, that I did every, I did every, I've done everything. The data did, did something that saved our lives. I have rerouted auxiliary power to the lateral thrusters, attempting to lower our descent. I ordered all hands to brace friend back. Then went back and sat down in the command chair. The ground got closer and closer. The port side hit a rock, and we all jolted that direction. Then the starboard side hit a rock, and we all went that way. The only person that fell out of their chair was Counselor Troy, who went back to the helm for some reason. Just as we hit the ground floor, Data dove over to her and protected her from anything else that might happen. As soon as we hit rock bottom, all the consoles on the back wall exploded in a shower of sparks. Worf was thrown from the tactical station to the lower part of the bridge, and I was thrown from the command chair down to the floor below, and all the lights went out. The only light on the bridge was the fires, and when Worf got, got in Council of Troy's chair, he turned on his palm light. At that point, the soft section was gliding across the ground, and the bridge was coming apart. At one point, steel beams on the ceiling came off and fell on top of people. I covered my head so I did not get hit. Data got hit on the back after he shielded Deanna's body. The saucer just kept going. I also was ready to go out and see if, see if I could force us to stop when I felt it start, start to slow down. Unfortunately, when we slowed down, all of the command chairs came loose and flew forward. Mr. Warp was the lucky one. He went head first into the ops console. I, unfortunately, was not so lucky and went face first into the view screen. Thanks to my powers, I do have a really high pain tolerance and can heal from most rooms fairly quickly. But that still hurt, because the screen is made of, out of transparent aluminum, which is very sturdy, but lightweight. Then the room finally stopped moving. I heard people grunting and moving. 
I tossed the command chair that landed on me, landed on me off, and then rubbed my sore neck. I noticed the bright light in my face. I looked up and saw that the little window on the ceiling of the bridge had broken. I wept a little because this was the end of the USS Enterprise. We have reached the point in the video where I'm going to be reenacting the scene I just the scene I had just talked about. Now the scene will also include the the landing of the the crash landing of the sausage section. So I'll break this up into into when that stuff will actually happen. This won't happen on all the parts. It'll happen sometimes. So with that, enjoy the scene. Where is he now? Today, I've been done. Go for ten years. What is this for? I still can't believe it. Keep trying. Stay. The scan for that vision plan time so it's too much interference. Can you find a way to scan for life forms? I would be happy to, sir. I just love scanning for life forms.
We have over a thousand people on board, board the ship in less than five minutes to see. Let's go! Accelerating, Jordy. We can die out of here. Separation sequence. Pump those power ones to 30 in.
Over on the mountain, Captain Carter and myself had a split up. He went to the probe to try and disarm it. I went for Soren. As Soren was crossing a bridge, I stepped out so he could see me. And he was pretty surprised to see me. He reached for his weapon, but I was already moving toward him. He pointed his weapon at me, but I grabbed his arm and slammed it a couple times on the railing until he dropped it. Then we got into a fist fight. Now I have advanced combat training, not only from Starfleet, but most of my downtime is spent on the holodeck fighting. I have learned fighting techniques from some man bat or someone, and I've also learned advanced CQC and stealth techniques from a guy who calls, calls himself Big Boss. It is very rare for someone to beat me in a fist fight. Unfortunately, this is one of those times. Soren got the upper hand and sent me over the railing. I landed hard on the rocks below, and it really hurt. I was about to get up and try again when I heard a noise that sounded like thunder. I looked up in the sky and saw the ribbon. I looked over to the probe to see if Captain Carr was there, and he was not. The probe started up and launched towards the sky. I watched it go up until I could see it no more. Then it hit the sun, and just like Amagosa, it got really bright, then really dark. Now that was, now that it was dark, I could see the ribbon so much better, and I hate to admit it, but it looked beautiful. I saw Soren get as high up as he could. He lifted his arms and embraced the ribbon. Just before the ribbon got to us, I looked to my left and saw Captain Picard standing there looking up. Then the ribbon went over us, and there was darkness. On the Enterprise, we started to pick up the pieces when my spider sense went off harder than it ever had before. I grabbed my phaser and blasted the view screen and went outside, just in time to see the shockwave coming right at us. The last thing I saw was my crew running, away, running from the shockwave. Then it hit us, and there was darkness. When I came to, my head was pounding and ringing. I said, oh, my head. As things started to clear, I realized that something seemed very off. I opened my eyes, and I was looking through the eye filters of my old Spider-Man costume. I yelled, and inadvertently I let go of the web line I was holding because I was hanging upside down. I quickly recovered and shot another web line so I could swing to a nearby roof. When I landed, I took my mask off for a moment and looked around. I could see that I was in New York City, where I grew up. I thought for a moment. The last thing I remember was being on the mountaintop of Viridian 3. Then nothing. I needed to find out what was going on. So I put my mask back on and headed for my old job at the Daily Bugle. As I'm swinging through the city, I was silently thanking myself for doing this on a somewhat regular basis on the holodeck. Otherwise, I might be running into a couple walls. When I made it to the bugle, I changed back into my street clothes and headed for the office of the editor-in-chief of the paper, J. Jonah Jameson. As I entered his office, I was expecting him to start yelling at me like he usually does. However, he looked at me, smiled, and said, Hello, Jonathan. How are you today? I wanted to say, Who are you, and what have you done with J.J.? But I said, I'm not sure, Mr. Jameson. This has been a weird morning. I was about to ask for today's paper so I can get a clue as to what was going on when Robbie Robertson, the co-editor, came in and said, Jonah, you need to see this, and he turned on the main TV. A reporter came on and said, if you are just now joining us, we are live on Liberty Island where someone is trying to steal Lady Liberty herself. Jameson muted the audio and turned to me and said, Dibble, get over there, Ann. I was already heading for the door and said, get pictures, I know the routine. And he said, no, get down there and stop whoever is doing this. I looked him right in the eye and said, how in the world am I supposed to do that? Then he said, for crying out loud, Dibble, have you been living under a rock all this time? You're Spider-Man. When he said that, I was stunned. The only thing I could make myself say was, what did you say? Robbie looked at me and said, you're Spider-Man. I had no time to find out how they knew that and I knew that I needed a faster mode of travel if I was going to get to, 
to Liberty Island in time to stop whoever was from stealing our national argument. So I said, if you know about that, then I'm guessing you know about this too. I said I was going ghost and then changed forms. They looked at me like, yes, we know about that as well. So I turned to Tangible and went through the wall and flew as fast as I could toward Liberty Island, which was about 114 miles per hour. As I was flying toward the island, I was wondering who would be smart enough to pull something like this off, yet also dumb enough to do it as well. When I got closer, I could see helicopters and a lot of police boats, and a lot of camera and news crews. When I was even closer, I saw that the person behind all this was Dr. Otto Octavius. I approached him and said, Gee, Doc, I thought you were a smart guy. You go and pull a stunt like this. He turned around and I was getting ready for a fight when he went up and went, Oh no, it's Jonathan Dimmel. I surrender. Then he put Lady Liberty down and surrendered himself to the surrendered himself and the police arrested him. I'm like, that was way too easy. With everything under control, I headed back to the mainland with people applauding me. I went to the top of the Chrysler building and just looked around. I was grinning from ear to ear. Something then, then something did not feel right. My smile faded and I said, this isn't right. I flew down to street level and changed back to my human form and said, this cannot be real. Then a voice from behind me said, just real as you want it to be. I whirled around to see who could have snuck up on me and with my spider sense, that was pretty much impossible. Then I saw that it was Guinan, and that was why she did not register my spider sense. And I, I walked up to her and asked where I was. She said this was the Nexus. I said, the Nexus? And she said, yes. I looked around and said, but how? Jameson hates Spider-Man. He has made it his goal in life to make New York hate me, and he never knew that I was, I was Spider-Man. And nobody knew about my ghost powers until I revealed them on the Enterprise. Guinan said that I could make the Nexus about anything I wanted. I nodded at this. Then I realized something. I turned to her and said, I thought you were on the Enterprise. She said that she was. But she was also here. Think of me as an echo of the person that you know. I thought for a moment and said, well, the Enterprise B being you up from the Lacool. Then a kid ran up to me and said, Jonathan! Jonathan! I looked down and said, yes, my own friend. And he said, I just wanted to thank you for putting your life on the line to keep us safe. I got down on one knee and said, that's the nicest thing anyone has ever said to me. He held his arms out and I gave him a quick hug. Then he ran over to a woman who I assumed was his mother. I stood back up and heard police sirens. And sure enough, four police cars went by. I was about to shoot out a whip line and go after them. What I remember what Guinan had said. If you go, you do not care about anyone. I looked at Guinan and made my choice. Can I leave the Nexus? She asked me where I would go. I did not understand the question. She said, well, like Soren said, time has no meaning here. So if you go, you can go anywhere, anytime. I said, okay, I know exactly where I want to go. To the mountaintop of Viridian 3. Just before Storm destroyed the star, I need to stop him. Then a bad thought struck me. I looked at Guyana and said, What happened to Captain Picard? She smiled and said he was in the Nexus as well, and was going to do the same thing as well. I smiled and realized that we needed help. I looked at Guyana and said, If you can come back with us, she stopped me and said, I can't go with you. I'm already there, remember? However, I think I know someone who can. And then things and things started to fade to black, and she said, and from his point of view, he just arrived as well. When I appeared in another location, I looked around and saw nothing but trees and grass. I heard a noise that sounded like pounding. I headed toward the noise and ran into Captain Picard. When I saw him, I said I said, Captain. Then I heard the noise again, and I looked over to where it came from and I could not believe my eyes. I was looking at a Starfleet officer. Judging by his uniform, 
He was from the late 23rd century. And I got a good look at his face. I said out loud, Kirk. James T. Kirk. He looked at us and said, beautiful day. After I recovered from staring at him, I said, oh, yes, it is. Then I realized what that noise was. He was out here chopping wood. Something I heard about, but never tried. He put another log in the stump. I asked if I could if I could take a whack at it. He said, sure, and handed me the axe. When I got into position, Captain Carr took a couple seconds back, and I said, oh, gee, thanks for the vote of confidence. I raised the axe and swung it down, and split the log in two on my first shot. As I handed the axe back to Captain Kirk, I looked at Captain Carr and said, I thought you learned not to underestimate me. He got a good laugh out of it. I looked at Captain Kirk and said, would you happen to know what's... And before I could finish, Kirk put the axe, axe into the tree stump, put his hand up and said, Do you smell something burning? I sniffed the air, and it did smell like someone wanted something extra crispy. He went inside, inside the house, and said, Looks like someone tried to cook some eggs. Captain Carter and myself stood at the door. When Kirk looked at us, he said, You can come in. It's all right. It's my house. He looked around and said, at least it used to be. I sold it years ago. Then we introduced ourselves. I'm Captain Jean-Luc Picard. And I'm Captain Jonathan Dibble of the USS Enterprise. We're from the future. He looked at us, then looked around the house, and found things that he should not have had because they gave, he gave them away. Then a female voice from upstairs said, Come on, Jim, I'm starving. How long are you going to be putting around in that kitchen? Captain Kirk recognized the voice. Antonia. Then he looked at us and said, The future. This is the past. He went to a chest and opened it to reveal what looked like a horseshoe. He held it and said, The day I told her, I was going back to Starfleet. He went over to the counter and grabbed some eggs. All dairy and eggs, her favorite. I was going to make them to soften the blow. I looked at him and said, Captain, this isn't really your house. All of us are caught up in some kind of temporal nexus. He cracked the eggs, opened it, and put them in a pan. He looked at me and said, Dill. I looked at him confused and said, I'm sorry? Dillweed. And the captain, behind the oregano. I then realized what he wanted, so I went to the captain cabinet and got the desired spice. As I was getting it, Captain Card asked Captain Kirk what the last thing he remembers. He thought for a moment as I gave him the spice he wanted. I was in the deflector control room on the Enterprise B. Then he handed the pan to Captain Card so he can ready a tray. Stir this, will you? Card grabbed the pan, burned himself a little, little, then stirred it. Kirk continued. The bulkhead gave away in front of me. And the next thing I knew, I was outside, chopping wood. You two walked up. Thank you. Then he took the pan away. I looked at him and said, Sir, history reports that you died, saving the Enterprise from an energy ribbon. He looked at me and said, You said you're from the future. I said, Yes. Then he asked, Then he asked, And I'm dead. I said, No, not really. Like I said, we're all caught in some kind of temporal, and he said, Temporal ribbon, I heard you. He put the eggs on a plate with some bacon, and then put them on a tray with a flour. Then looked a little puzzled. He said, something is missing. But that toast popped up, popped out of, out of a toaster, and he put them on the plate as well. As he was walking off, I really got down to business. Captain, we need your help. I want you to come back with us. As I was, ta as I was talking, he headed for the stairs. We need to go to a planet, Meridian 3. We need to stop a man called Sorn from destroying a star. Millions of lives are at stake. When he got to the stairs, he looked at us and said, History considers me dead. Who am I to argue with history? Captain Carr looked at him and said, You're a Starfleet officer. You have a duty. Kirk snapped at him. I don't need to be lectured by you. I was out saving the galaxy when your grandfather was in diapers. Besides, I think the galaxy owes me one. I was not happy with, I was not happy with Captain Kirk. He stepped, Kirk stepped down and talked to me. 
I was like you once. So blinded by things like duty and other Starfleet things. He smiled and said, Not this time. He walked up the stairs. This time I'm going to walk up these stairs, arch into the bedroom. I'm going to ask her to marry me. With that, he slammed the door shut. Captain Picard and myself walked, walked up the stairs and stood in front of the bath, bedroom door. I put my ear against, against it, but I did not hear anything. So I threw the door open and found myself in a stable. I looked around and saw Captain Kirk. I went over to him and said, Is this Antonia's room? Because if it is, it's taking the phrase that I raised y'all in a bar way too far. He said this is even better. This is my uncle's barn in Iowa. He taught me all I know about horses. And if I'm right, this is the day I met Antonia. Eleven years ago. He opened the door, the barn doors, turned around and said, this next is of yours. I love it. I get to try things all over again. With that, he hopped on a nearby horse and rode off. I was wondering what we were going to do now when I heard a weird noise. I turned around and saw that Captain Picard was putting a second saddle on another horse. He turned to me and said, I'll help you out. I responded and said, no thank you. I'll just fly. And we raced to catch up with Kirk. We found him just as he was jumping over a pretty good gap. When, when he knew we could hear him, he said that he, he must have jumped that 50 times, and it scared him to death every time. But not this time, because it's not real. Then he looked up and said, and, and said, neither is she. I looked at what he was looking at, and it was a woman who I assumed was Antonia. I looked at him and said, come back with us. Make a difference again. He smiled, looked at me, and said, so you're both captain of the Enterprise? Picard said yes. Kirk asked, asked me if he was thinking about retiring. Captain Picard said he was not, not thinking about it. And Kirk said, let me tell you something. Don't. Don't let them promote you. Don't let them transfer you. Well, don't let them do anything. They can take you off the bridge of that ship, because while you're there, you can make a difference. Then he looked at me and said, what's the name of that planet, Viridian 3? I said yes. Then he said that he was guessing the odds were against us and the situation was grim. I said, oh yes, definitely. He smirked and said if Spock were here, he would say that I was an irrational, illogical human being for taking this on. Sounds like fun. We all laughed, and all three of us left the Nexus in a bright white light. Dr. Soren started, to walk, started walking over a bridge. Captain Kirk appeared in front of him. Soren looked at him and wanted to know who he was. Then Captain Picard appeared over here behind him and said, He's James T. Kirk. Then I said, Don't you read history, Doc? And I literally appeared in a ghost form, floating to the left of Soren. This was my plan for all of us to block Soren and threaten him to deactivate the probe. Unfortunately, he went the only way that, that had no that had no that had no one. All three of us tried to grab him, but he got away. Captain Picard said that he needed to get to get to the launcher. The road be the ribbon will be here any moment. Kirk said that said that he would take care of Soren. I told Captain Picard I would take him to the launcher. I grabbed him by the waist and flew him toward the launcher. Partway there my spider sense kicked in, and I told Captain Picard that Captain Kirk needed my help. He said, Make it so. I put him down and raced over to Captain Kirk. I saw Storm put his weapon to Kirk's head and said, Actually, I am familiar with history, Captain. And if I'm not mistaken, you're dead. With that, I landed on Soren's head. I changed back to human form and fought him again. He got a lunky punch in and I went over the edge. I started to fall. However, I shot out a whip line and swung around and kicked Soren in the face. And this time, he went over. I did not mean to do that. I looked down and saw that he had grabbed the rope that was hanging there. I made sure that Captain Kirk was okay, and he said, I thought you were taking Captain Picard to the launcher. I said, I changed my mind. I hear the captains can do that. We made our way to Captain, Kirk, Captain Picard, 
when I heard a cloaking device. I looked toward the launcher and saw that it was gone. Soren had cloaked it, and I was not sure if it would still fire when cloaked, and I was not about to sit around and wait, wait for that to happen. The rope that Soren was using gave way slightly, and Soren fell. And when he did, he dropped the remote for the launcher, and landed on a nearby bridge. I said, we need that remote. We headed for the bridge. When we got closer, I noticed something did not feel right. I looked over at, I looked over at Soren and saw that he was gone. I said, Captain, wait! Where's Soren? The captain pressed on, then my spider sense went off a little too late. Kurt was cro crossing the bridge when Soren fired his weapon, splitting the bridge in two. The remote was on one side, and Kirk was on another. I went to the bridge as fast as I could, and got on my stomach and reached for the captain. I reached as far as I could, but I could not quite reach him. Kirk lost what grip he had on the bridge and started to fall. I leapt for him and got him just in time. I pulled us up and I heard a small rumble in the distance. I looked toward the sky, and I could see the ribbon closing fast. I said they were running out of time. I looked over on the other side and saw the remote. Look, the control. It's still on the other side. Kirk looked, Kirk looked at me and said, you, get, you, you, help, you help the car. I'll grab the device. I said, no. You know to make that, make that by yourself. We need to work together. Kirk grabbed my arm and said, we are working together. Trust me. I got up and said, good luck, Captain Kirk. Kirk shrugged and said, call me Jim. Before I went ghost, I thought, I can't even call Captain Picard by his first name. How am I supposed to call a living legend by his first name? With that, I flew toward Captain Picard. On the way, I thought I heard a very loud crash, but I ignored it. I could see Captain Picard working hard on the launcher when I heard Swarm bellow, Picard! Get away from that launcher! He pulled his weapon out and pointed at Picard. Now! The card saw me and lifted his arm up. I grabbed him and flew away. I grabbed his other arm and said, Hang on! I took us a safe distance away and turned around just in time to see Launcher explode in a great big ball of fire. I asked Picard what he did, and he said he engaged the docking claims. I smiled and said, Pretty good idea. Captain Picard asked where Swarm was. It was then that the crash finally registered in my brain. I said, oh no, and flew us over to where the, where the bridge was and saw that half of it was gone. I looked at the rocks below and saw the other half buried. I flew to the ground and saw a boot. I lifted the bridge up and saw, saw the captain lying there. I already knew there was nothing that I could do. Kirk looked at us and asked if we did it. Did we make a difference? I smiled and said, we did. Thank you. Kirk smiled and said, it was the least he could do for the captain of the Enterprise. It was fun. Then his smile faded and he said, oh my. Then breathed his last. And I bowed my head in respect. Then Captain Picard and myself made a little grave out of some rocks and gave him a, a small funeral. On the Enterprise, we started to pick up the pieces when Worf said that he just picked up the, an explosion on his tricorder. I opened mine up and said it's approximately 200 yards east of here. I saw Jordy and asked him if the shuttles were working, and he said that they were, and they just got the bay doors open. I said, excellent, Worf, you're with me. We got in the shuttle and headed for the source of the explosion. We got to some mountains, and then I saw them. We landed and, and exited the shuttle. Worf was the first, first one to greet them. Captain Picard looked at us in the shuttle and asked if we had some trouble with the Klingons. I said, you could say that, sir. And the other me and myself merged together, and both of us knew what had happened on the Enterprise and on the mountain. Captain's Log Supplemental. Three Starfleet vessels have arrived in orbit and have begun beaming up the Enterprise survivors. Our casualties were light. However, the Enterprise herself cannot be salvaged. I was in Carr's red room helping him find something. When I found his album, I asked if this was it. He looked down and said, yes. Yes, that's it, Jonathan. Thank you. I looked around and said, I'm going to miss this ship, Jean-Luc. 
She went before her time. He smiled when I said his name, and asked her I remember what Soren had said about time. I said that he said the time was a predator. It has stalked us all our lives. Jean-Luc said that he was going to think of time as an ally, and he was going to cherish every moment of it. He smiled and said, after all, we're only mortal. I laughed and said, speak for yourself. I plan to live forever. I walked over to the command chair and said, well, I got to sit in the big chair for a little while. Captain Picard smiled and said, I'm sure you still will. Somehow I doubt this will be the last ship to carry the name Enterprise. With that, we took one last look around before I tapped my comment and said, Do it a fair again. Two to beam up. I looked at the helm as long as I could. Before, I was looking at the transporter room at the Farragut, wondering what my life of a Starfleet captain had in store for me next.